Lord, as we start, we ask you to speak what is true. Amen. I want to start with a core memory of mine, one that has shaped me and has rattled me and plagues me as I go through life. And I hope it unsettles you as well. I was a theological student in South Africa and my practical theology lecturer arranged this excursion for us to go to a landfill, a dump site, a Milieustraat, not in the Dutch sense, but a Milieu mountain where all the trash of the city gets dumped. And he didn't say much about this excursion. He says, we need to go and see. And so we went to, to the east of Pretoria. There's a place called, I can't remember what it's called exactly, but there's this landfill site and we arrived there and we parked at the bottom of the mountain and started making our way to the top. And as we were walking, we quickly realized there's hundreds of people rummaging through the trash, opening up the trash bags, looking what they can find, collecting cardboard, plastic, glass. And then there was this whole economic hub where these people were gathering and collecting these things, trying to sell them just to make a few cents. And as we walked, we also realized that there's more going on here. There's women and children also going through these trash, collecting rotten food, meat, vegetables, taking them off to a side where there was these small fires where they were grilling this meat and this food and then selling them to the community of people that called this place home. Abject poverty. Like, I can remember the stench, the smell of the, of the rot just hitting you in the face as you walked around there. It clung to you in an in a, in a unreal way. And I remember as we, we stood on this mountain and we looked back towards the city, you could see in the distance, you could see these big walls of the Gulf estates and the massive villas just off to the side. A striking contrast. One that I, to this day, do not know what to do with. But it's one I, I honestly believe Jesus speaks into and invites us all to wrestle with. Luke 6 verse 20. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Last night, I quickly just looked up this landfill and uh, just seeing the um, kind of the remarks people made of the place, the commentary. And the first one just simply said, not for the faint of heart. And the second one, the closest to hell I have ever been. God have mercy. Scenes like this perpetuate society all over the world. There's a really, really interesting site um, by um, Johnny Miller. It's a photographer. He does this aerial photography of unequal, unequal scenes. And if you want to see a visually striking image of what I'm trying to convey with words, go and look at unequalscenes.com. You just see pictures from all over the world where this is the reality of many, many, many people. And my purpose today is not to make you feel guilty or myself make you feel guilty. That's not the point. But the point is to invite us to wrestle with these realities, to wrestle with the realities of what we see and experience in the world and then ask ourselves, well, what does the gospel say about this? What does Jesus say about this? And what are the implications and the applications for your and my life? We're in a series focused on Jesus. We are looking at his life and his work and his ministry and asking that question, how is this good news for you and me today? And so we will do that together and wrestle. My name is Alan. For those of you who do not know me, <laughs> I'm one of the pastors. And I was not scheduled to speak today, but here I am. And the irony didn't fall on me yesterday when Caroline asked me to kind of step in. I was in Hanos, <laughs> loading up my meat and my sausage casings. I'm preparing for summer. <laughs> Going to make some meat for the girl. And 
the text came which he confirmed asking me to speak and the irony of that paradox of life. Blessed are the poor and here I am. So let me pray for us and we'll dig into some scriptures together. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, you who came all the way and gave it up to give your life for us, showed us how to love and serve recklessly with all that you have and invite us to graciously do the same. Lord, in a world that we, we all experience as broken, help us to be the kind of people you desire us to be, salt and light, generous, loving, and kind. Be with us this morning and speak to us that which is true, I pray. Amen. So if you have your Bible with you, you can turn along to Luke chapter 6. I'm going to be spending quite a bit of time there. And before I read, I think it's really important what I said earlier. This is not to make us all feel guilty, but this is an invitation to wrestle with the realities of the world and the realities of the text. And as you, if you've been coming to Crossroads for a long time, those of you will know that we always, always emphasize the message of grace. And that this conversation, which is a particularly hard one for the world we live in, is a gracious invitation. And I want you to hold on to that. Luke 6, verse 31 to 36, it reads as follows. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. A challenging piece of text, but one that ends with that gracious invitation to be merciful as he is merciful, to love as God loves us, to try and embody that into our own lives. Our framing text for the series comes from Luke 4 or from Isaiah 61, as Miriam already read, and the passage I read earlier as well on blessed are the poor or good news to the poor. It's the emphasis of my message this morning. And before I start, I think it'd be worth our while to maybe just take a second to define what it means, the poor, as it is used in Scripture. And I, I found it interesting that there's no universally agreed upon definition on this. If you actually go and look at the, uh, the UN and the WEF, they, they kind of define, they've got this metric on what the poor are. And the, if I have this correctly, um, I think it's $2.17. If you're under that line, if you earn less than that in a day, and just think about that, $2.17. If you earn less than that, then you are extremely poor. That is kind of their metric, right? If you can think about that in this context, that would probably not work at all. And most of us can't do a, a stop at the grocery store for that amount in a month, $2.17. What's that, 70 euros? Give or take a few. Extreme poverty. In the Netherlands, I, I found this quite interesting. Um, the CPB, the Central Plan Bureau, or something like that. There we go. Um, they have a not much but sufficient limit definition for poverty, which is a quite a not much. So you have something but not much but sufficient. And it kind of goes on and explains that it is people who living on this line can afford groceries, sports membership, and a short holiday. 
And the limit for a single person household in 2023 was 1,508 euros, which is vastly different. And Sazi made the point last week that the world we live in here in the Netherlands is one of the most extreme wealthiest. Knowing this right, makes, has to make you wrestle with the conversation. What do we do with a world that has abject poverty? And I'm not saying you don't get poverty here. That's not what I'm saying at all. Because I know if people earn less than this in this country, they are really struggling. Really, really struggling. I know inflation has hit all of us hard in many ways. I'm not saying poverty does not exist in this place, but it looks very, very different compared to the image I sketched in the beginning. What do we do with that? Let's start with a simple definition on poverty or the poor. It is those who lack something or do not have the sufficient means just to get by. Very simple definition. Those who do not have enough to get by. But then let's layer that. It is a socioeconomic condition. It says here that the poor are those who do not have enough resources, the means, or the talents that the world values. And because you do not have that which the world values, you are put on the outside, on the outskirts of society. And you get that language you find in Luke so often, those the marginalized, the outcasts, the oppressed. The poor are those who have no value and accordingly no dignity. They are non-participants. And you often find this rhetoric in when, we look, when it comes to election, election season, right? That the poor are a burden on our society and a problem that needs to be solved. We need to get rid of the problem. And there's some truth to that, but it's also problematic. But then let's layer it a bit further. There's a sense that the poor is about power and agency. It is the, about the, the ability to make decisions about the way you conduct your life. You see, when you, and, and these two are very related, but also very different. That if I have certain means, if I have cert access to certain resources, certain networks, I can make certain decisions about I want, how I want to conduct my life. But if I don't have that, then I'm kind of powerless to speak out to change the reality of which I live in. But this definition will, I mean, slightly help, be, be helpful for us in a second as well. So it's about resources and wealth on the one side and powerlessness on the other side. Now it's interesting, especially in the Gospel of Luke, more than <laughs> any other book in the Bible. Well, I can't say that the Bible is full of this. Jonathan Edwards makes the emphasis that the one message that is clear in the Bible above everything else is that we are to take care of the poor. You cannot deny it from beginning to the end. That is the question that the prophets address. It's the invitation of the law as well to take care of the poor. And then Jesus comes and says, yes, it's that, but it's more than that. It's not just taking care of the poor that's part of your own community. It's taking about care of all the poor. The text we just read, it says, love your enemies, those who are other and completely different from you. And in the context of the passage we read, it really has to do with the poor. What are we to do with that? It is interesting if you read the life of Jesus, how he not just speaks about this issue, but he really identifies with the poor. The Bible depicts him as a person who continuously borrows things. He borrows food just to multiply, to give to others. He borrows the donkey to enter Jerusalem. The Bible says he had no place to lay down his head. And so it's important for us to kind of hold on to that because Jesus, yes, he speaks about the poor, but he speaks to the poor and the rich, but he speaks to them from a place where he has taken on a kind of poverty upon himself. And that changes the way we understand that. And that's kind of the power and the scandal of the whole Jesus message. Because if you had to kind of think for a second, who is it that is poor that you know? Or even if, just think of a context where there is extreme poverty. 
How would a person in that place be able to speak the way and have the influence that Jesus has in the world that we live in today? And that kind of scares me sometimes. Because I kind of often wonder to myself, would I, would I recognize Jesus if he came around today? Would he hang out in the same circles as me? Or not? Jesus has this preoccupation with those in need. And he over and over says that he came for those in need. But the message also applies to those who have. Sazi, last week he said it so clearly, he said, in a very real sense, the gospel is not for us. But I think if I can nuance that in a way, it is for all of us. But the application looks slightly different. The appeal to each one of us looks different. I want to read just Matthew 5 verse 3. And it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I kind of want to just pick up that last layer of the definition of the poor. The powerlessness. I've kind of made it clear that the poor is about economic substance. But there is a sense in the gospel, and Matthew gives us that, that it's not just about material ends. But it's about that powerlessness. And, I, and I've had conversations with several of you over the last year about burnout of being stuck in a place where you don't have the energy, the means to get out of that. You're at your rope's end. and You cannot get beyond that. And I think this text speaks to something of that. God wants to meet us in that place and say, hey, you are blessed in that place. And I'm going to come back to why I can say that in a second. Those who are downtrodden and at the end of their ropes. But what about the rich? What about those who do not identify as the poor? Which I think for most of us would probably be us, if I'm honest with myself. I know I am in that category. But it's interesting, I I was reading a couple of commentaries and they kind of just explained the rich as defined by Luke. It says it is those who are greedy, those who exploit the poor, those who are bent on making money at all costs. Those whose entire orientation of their lives is on money and status. Those who are arrogant and powerful. One commentator went as far as says, they are slaves and worshippers of mammon, the god of money. And I read, read that and I was like, I, I didn't resonate with that, even though I know I am on the rich side of this conversation. And I don't see myself as an exploiter of those who are poor. I, I honestly hope I'm not. But it made me think, what, what, who are the rich? And how do we think about that? And yes, the Bible is very clear on those who do the exploitation. If you read the prophets, if you read Amos, he really goes hard after the Jewish people and the leaders of, of the Hebrews, saying, hey, you guys are missing the entire point. You should take care of the poor, the widows, the orphans. There is a very clear message against exploitation. But there's also a sense that I am rich and I know I'm rich and I need to make sense of that reality within the world that is so broken. And, and I, I often find it so interesting. I, I remember reading an article a few years ago on, on the lie of the middle class. And I felt, felt completely at home in that article because it kind, of, it kind of put me in a place where it challenged me to kind of rethink how I, no, I'm not actually in the middle class. I am rich. And what it did is it kind of invited me not to th- compare myself with the 1% that has everything and has no care about money in the world, but to compare myself to the other 10% who has absolutely nothing. And that is a much more healthier comparison and helps me wrestle with my wealth. And I don't have a clear answer. I've said that and I'll say it a few times again. <laughs> but it's an invitation to wrestle around these conversations. And so Jesus in Luke 6, he a bit further in the passage that already gives warnings against the rich. 
And what it has to do is it has to do with this unhealthy attachment to wealth and to our stuff and our possessions. It really comes down to, am I defining my reality, who I am around my material possessions? Is it the means by which I relate to the world I live in? Or can I distance myself in such a way from it that I'm free from it, that it doesn't dictate how I orientate myself in the world? But can I free myself from it so that I can also give wholeheartedly because I'm dependent on the one who gives? That is the invitation we're getting to. In Luke chapter 18 and 19, there's two examples where Jesus very directly addresses the rich. In Luke chapter 18, you have the parable or the story of the, the rich, um, rich person who's extremely faithful, who abides by the law, comes to Jesus, hey, I want, I want to be perfect. And Jesus says, oh, good, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor. And he walks away sad, he cannot do that. And then in chapter 19, you have the story of Zacchaeus. And there you have a tax collector who has mistreated and robbed people through his enterprise as a tax collector. And he has this encounter with Jesus and he, and he goes to Jesus and says, look, I have repaid everybody that I've wronged and I have gone and I sold half of my possessions. And then Jesus says so beautifully, salvation has come to this home today. Challenging challenging text for us. What are we to do with them? In the world we live in, the poor is all around us. And scripture in a strange way says that we will always have the poor. Deuteronomy 15, 11. There will always be poor people in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. And I love what God does with the, poor, with the reality because I, I don't think the poor is an expression. It's, it's an indication of the brokenness of our humanity, of our selfish natures. That is why poverty exists because people make use of, misuse of the world's resources and of other people for their own gain. And so po the poor are symptomatic of our human condition. And, but the Bible kind of invites us then, despite that, despite that reality, to live open-handedly, to give graciously. So the question then which remains is, why is it that the poor are blessed? Why is the gospel good news to the poor? And perhaps is it also good news to those who are rich? And I think what's really important is that Jesus, when he <laughs> speaks this message, he's speaking to those who are both rich and poor. And as I said, we have particular entanglements around stuff. All of us orientate ourselves, both the rich and the poor, around material possessions in a particular way. For those who are poor, often with resentment to those who have and hatred. Those who are rich, looking down upon those who do not have. And so the invitation of the gospel is that both the rich and the poor is to be transformed by recognizing the giver of all things. That we are to live our lives with thankfulness and with gratitude and with immense charity if we have the means to do so. And so if the rich participate in this reckless thing Jesus invites us to, to give without the expectation of return, that would be really good news to those who are poor physically. But there is also a sense of contentment for those who are poor, I, I've been to extremely poor churches all across Africa and the joy and the celebration of being able to worship the God who gives life is something that I cannot translate with words. 
but both are in need of salvation. It's a call to love the way God loves, to be merciful as the way God is merciful. God who is abundance, gives himself to us over and over and over again. And invites us to give something of ourselves to the world. To learn from his selfless giving. And invites us graciously to participate. To care for those who cannot care for themselves. I want to invite the band to the front. And conclude with a thought. Miriam gave you all papers. And what I want you to do simply is think of the poor. Whether that's your own wrestling in the conversation, whether it's a family member or a friend that is struggling with the conversation, whether it's a situation in the world somewhere far that you are deeply moved by, where you know the poor are in need to be blessed, to hear good news. Examples abound. Whether it's you wrestling with your own wealth. But what, what do I do with the salary that's come in that is potentially much more than I actually need? What do I do with that, Lord? Help me wrestle with that question. I want to invite you to just write that down. And at the end, we'll collect them. Katuna will be in the back with the basket. And I think Miriam explained it already. There will be a basket down here as well. And we're going to make a chain for Easter. I'm not sure if you said that. but Because we know that the gospel is good news. And that Jesus' desire is to break these chains. And he invites us to participate in that. So take your time. Take a moment to write it down. And as you do that, I want to just read a, a simple prayer from the Franciscan order. And we'll continue in worship. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers and half-truths truths and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. And may God bless you with anger at injustice, at oppression and at the exploitation of people so that you may work for justice and freedom and peace. And may God bless you with tears to be shed for those who suffer in pain, rejection, hunger, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain to joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe you can make a difference. And so that you can do what others claim cannot be done, to bring justice and kindness to all God's children and the poor.